Hi, everybody. What in the world am I doing here? There's a runway outside, but I don't seem to be flying towards it. Am I flying drunk? These are S-turns on final to land. You don't see these demonstrated very often, and that's probably for good reason. What we're doing is increasing our track distance between the airplane and our planned touchdown spot. The bank angles and the load factors aren't any larger than elsewhere in the pattern, nor are we flying particularly slowly. So the direct risk of stalling or loss of control from the maneuver alone is pretty low. But there's a lot of pilot attention required to judge your energy, decide how far to turn, when to reverse your turn, etc. And that can lead to a failure to notice when you come off airspeed or even see newly erected wires, traffic, etc. So why do I think that this is worth showing the world? Let's take a look. Here's a Lancer carrying too much energy into an approach overrunning a runway in Texas. This is after a previous go around and less than 10 miles from the big 7,000 foot long runway at McKinney. Here's a Piper Aztec, an airplane with pretty awesome short and rough field capability, carrying just a little bit too much energy into the airport at St. Bart's. That's a 2,100 foot long runway, by the way. Here's a Cessna 172 going off the end of 1,500 feet of runway in Japan. And another, and another, and another. Maybe having some more tools available to help us get rid of energy will help us get down. Maybe awareness of those tools will help us apply a little bit better judgment. Maybe I'm flat wrong. Well, here goes. Let's imagine we're flying along and we just point the airplane's nose towards the ground. Sure, we'll descend, but we'll also pick up speed. Once we're low and fast, we can scoot along for miles, waiting for this speed to slowly decay, or we can pull the nose back up and turn that speed back into altitude. So getting the airplane up or down isn't a simple point-and-shoot affair. Transitioning between high and slow and low and fast is basically what we're doing when we fly egg-shaped granny loops. When we're high, we're slow. When we're low, we're fast. The engine is putting about as much work into the airplane as drag is pulling work out of the airplane. So let's take a little look to see how force, work, and power all do different things to affect the energy state of the airplane. If we go back to looking at our loopy cartoon plane, we're keeping about the same amount of energy on the plane. We're just altering the ratio of kinetic to potential energy. The engine is working about as much energy into the plane as drag is working energy out of the plane. So if we want to get down, the plane needs to lose energy. If we want to get up and fast, the plane needs to gain energy. That's thrust, power, and drag stuff. If we keep the plane at a constant speed and angle of attack when we add thrust, after maneuvering settles down and the airplane returns to equilibrium, the angle of climb is determined by thrust minus drag plus the aft component of weight. Here's a formula from aerodynamics for naval aviators if it helps. The critical factor is the difference between thrust and drag on the plane. If there's no thrust on the plane, things simplify. Angle of descent is controlled by the amount of drag versus the forward component of weight. In equilibrium, lift is essentially equal to weight. This is why we get our best angle of glide at conditions that provide the best ratio of lift to drag. Whether you're descending for angle or rate, if you want to get down, you're going to need minimum thrust or power and maximum drag. So we need to stop making power and thrust. So here's a fake European 1960s jet. Our friend here is higher and faster than he'd like, so he pulls the thrust to idle. Jets are generally pretty clean. This means they're pretty scooty even when the thrust is pulled to idle. So engineers build in a number of drag options. There are speed brakes. Often speed brakes are just a function of wing spoilers, but sometimes there are panels mounted elsewhere on the plane, like uh, the rear fuselage. They work best at high speeds. There are flaps which work best at low speed, and of course, we can use the landing gear as a drag device too. Most of the people watching these videos are probably flying planes with propellers and fixed landing gear. 
Engineers assume props make plenty of drag, and they're right. Pulling the power abruptly to idle is not always a smart thing to do, however. We can also fly the airplane in ways that create more drag. We can dive to inefficient speeds, and we can also load up the wing to create lots of induced drag. Here's a T-38 HUD as the pilot does an overhead brake. The speed tape is on the left side of the HUD, and I've sped this up. Pay attention to how fast the speed decays in the turn versus how fast it decays after the plane rolls to level and before the gear is deployed. So that's enough theory for one video. Let's see what these things do in the actual airplane. Around best glide speed, or 60 miles per hour in my Piper Cub, we lose about 600 feet per minute every time we try it. And over a number of runs, it looks like we cover about one nautical mile at the cost of about 700 feet or so. In most airplanes, minimum sink speed is usually only about 15% or so higher than stall speed. So in the Cub, that translates to about 45 or 50 miles per hour. At idle power, with my engine and prop, we see a sink rate of about 400 feet per minute, and we lose closer to 900 feet per nautical mile. There's a lot of instrumentation error in the Cub at these low speeds, however. Idle power and 100 miles per hour straight ahead, we sink at about 2,200 feet per minute. Idle power, 100 miles per hour, but with 60 degrees of bank, we lose about 2,900 feet per minute, this time with a full slip. 3,800 feet per minute. In an engine failure scenario, best glide is pretty useful, and most of us know this. As battery-powered devices proliferate, cockpit and cabin fires become a more considerable hazard. So some of the more rapid descent options may also be worth considering as well. But these are all scenarios which are crystal clear to the pilot. What works when things aren't so clear? One of those scenarios would be when you're high, but for some reason you're not going around to make another attempt at the landing. So I collected a bunch of footage of myself putting the plane in a higher than normal energy state and figuring out ways to get it down. Let's pretend we're gliding our yellow biplane into inflatable advertising cone thingies. Watch the vertical bearing changes to the top of the cones. The red cone we're going to overfly, it's close and you see it move down the windshield and pass beneath us. Judging whether we'll hit the top of the red cone is easy because the change in vertical bearing is pretty big, it's pretty easy to pick up on. Judging whether we'll hit the top of the yellow or the top of the blue cone is tougher though. The differences in angles are smaller. You don't get a clear idea of what we're going to hit and what we're going to miss until we get a lot closer. And what this means is fine judgment of our glide path by eye it takes a lot of practice and it takes a lot of attention. We have to work our minds extra hard because we're trying to get what we need to know from data that has relatively low resolution. This is also why it's easy to lose track of your airspeed, reserve lift, or AOA when you're trying to play things out just right. It's natural to focus on your vertical bearing to judge your glide path. So here we are in the Cessna 170 with a simulated engine failure and a clear traffic pattern. At this distance, it's hard to tell whether we can make the runway, so Prudence has me keeping my speed at best glide until we know for sure that we have the field made. To land precisely, I need to be about 10 to 15 miles per hour slower than my best glide speed. Now I've gone from low on energy to having too much of it, and this becomes a full flap landing, touching down about 50 feet past the numbers. So even in a low energy situation, you're still going to need to know how to get rid of your energy fast in order to be anywhere near precise. But you already know how to fly. The bigger lesson is one in human factors. Whether we're talking about carrying power into a spot landing, an engine failure scenario, or landing out of a circling approach at night without vertical guidance to a runway, we have a judgment call to make about our energy management. And that judgment call is only as accurate as the information we have in front of us. Reserve lift indicators, AOA indicators, are often placed on top of instrument panels or even integrated into a HUD, specifically so we don't have to take a second or two to look at an indicator. This is because we're spending that much energy trying to discern fine energy management details from rough external cues. Trying to get fine details into the cockpit requires a pilot who's able to receive and process those details. Whether you're relying on an AOA indicator or tactile cueing from the airplane, 
The data we're using is only as good as our fatigue level, proficiency, our sensors, instrument calibration, display lag, etc. Imagining that we're going to reliably thread a needle from several miles out, especially in the real world and real operational conditions, that's just not realistic. So let's look at some energy dissipation options starting with a typical forward slip from our pre-solo training. So here we are a little bit high in the cub. We have forward slips available to us. Slips make the plane more draggy and the wing less wingy. The great thing about a slip is it offers very fine control of the plane's drag and you can use anywhere from no slip at all to a full slip and there's very little time delay involved. As soon as you yaw your nose away from the relative wind, out of coordination, the energy is coming off the airplane. And as soon as you yaw the nose back into the relative wind, into coordination, you're back to a normally performing craft. My younger daughter wants to say hello to everybody. Let's take a look at a variation on the forward slip. This time we're closer to normal in terms of our glide path, but we're fast. Our airspeed indicator, along with the airplane's feel, its tactile cueing, tells us that we're fast. We can still use a slip to get rid of energy, only this time we're dissipating kinetic energy instead of potential energy. So we can use a slip to go from being fast to on speed. I'm not making any brilliant points here. Make plane draggy, plane gets draggy, right? But you already know how to fly. The point with both of these slips is the pilot has to be able to know whether the plane has too much energy or not. The pilot's mind has to have enough free capacity to explicitly or implicitly observe, evaluate, and act on the information available. If for whatever reason we cannot make the airplane more draggy, we can also give ourselves more distance and more time to dissipate energy, and this can be done with S-turns on final. Occasionally you'll see airplanes that we fly for work doing this. Usually this is requested by air traffic control for spacing, rather than energy dissipation, but we still do it. Here's a picture of Air Canada doing some gentle S-turns at Las Vegas. If you imagine a runway, there's a cone of positions and energy states from which an airplane can land. And depending on your judgment, there's a tighter cone which you'll find acceptable to land from. So this cone essentially moves off the approach end of the runway some distance, and that distance is set by the pilot's judgment, among other factors. Typically, the plane is turned on to final some distance out, and energy is played out on the final. If a plane is low on energy, however, say low, slow, far away, whatever, you may see a pilot turn directly towards the runway or directly to a point where he can line up on the runway. There's less distance to cover and less time to burn. That clip I just used of thinking I was low in the 170, I'm doing that in that clip. So if cutting the distance is good for a low energy state, giving yourself more distance to cover and more time to burn is good for a high energy state. Sometimes this can be deliberately overshooting the final. Sometimes it can be a series of turns along the final. Here's what overshooting the final and turning for the numbers looks like in my plane. I was experimenting with new camera mounts and settings here, so the camera is at a weird angle that makes it hard to tell the amount of bank being used. We're only using maybe 30 degrees of bank here or less. Anyway, there's the runway. We're going to overshoot the final a little and reevaluate our condition when we turn back towards the field. We might have lost just a little too much energy, so we aim straight for the numbers. At unfamiliar airports, offset finals with a high workload are a great way to set yourself up for a wire strike. And that increased workload is the real risk here. So let's try demonstrating the same thing, but this time let's build in a little bit more margin for foul-ups. Now we're managing both energy and risk, and we're doing so in a couple of ways. We're crossing the end of the field straight enough to keep us alert for hazards close to the ground and high enough that we aren't going to snag a wire that we might not have noticed. We can maneuver the plane for rough energy management. For fine energy management, we have flaps, and if terrain and conditions permit a lower angle of approach, power would provide very fine energy control. Today, I'm keeping it a little bit steep. There's the runway all the way down there. Like before, we cross the final, but this time we don't try to get it just right. We only try to get the airplane into the ballpark of good for our energy state. Now we turn back to intercept the final at some distance from the runway. 
By getting the plane into the ballpark of good rather than just right, we have enough spare brain power to play our remaining drag or our remaining power as necessary to make a good enough landing. And that spare brain power is really necessary close to the ground because close to the ground is where we're liable to get surprised, and close to the ground is where those surprises can become very costly indeed. If you remember your middle school trig, our progress towards the runway is our ground speed times the cosine of our track deviation. Or simply put, it means we have to turn a lot to make this maneuver worthwhile, otherwise we make the plane all wiggly for nothing. And if it looks like I'm getting kind of busy, it's because I'm getting kind of busy. And if you need to do this type of thing to make the runway, is there really a good reason not to just go around and try again? Superficially, this would seem like it's about how to get the airplane lower and slower. But the real issue is information, perceptions, and processing in the pilot's minds. Respecting and understanding how the myriad factors overcame these pilots requires us to respect and understand these pilots themselves. And when we do that, I hope we can learn from their experiences.